you are in the right place today. And we're excited to have you in here with us. We are in the final week of a four-week teaching series that I've been doing called Fresh Fire, Living the Spirit-Led Life. And really I've been breaking down and trying to give you some real good wisdom and information concerning who Holy Spirit is and how He operates in our lives. And the verse we've been using as our text verse is Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. It says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants, as well as on my maid servants, God said, I will pour out my spirit in those days. God was promising an outpouring of his Holy Spirit upon all flesh. And again, the reason why that's so mind boggling is because up until that time, the Holy Spirit, God's presence, would only be poured out upon specific individuals. You had to be one of those special people, one of the prophets, one of the priests, one of the kings, or somebody else that God was using for a specific assignment. But God was saying through the prophet Joel, there's going to come a day that I'm not just going to pick special people to pour out my spirit on, but all those that are yielded to me, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Somebody shout, that day. That day. Come on, I can't hear you. Shout, that day, that day. is this day. In other words, we are living in that time that Joel was prophesying about. After Jesus was crucified and raised from the dead, he opened up the door so that those of us that are in Christ, that have opened up our hearts to receive Jesus Christ as our Lord, not only are we saved, not only do we have relationship with the Father God, not only are we guaranteed that when we breathe our last breath, we'll open up our eyes in heaven, one of the greatest gifts that comes out of our salvation package is that we have this amazing opportunity to be in relationship with the third person of the Trinity called Holy Spirit. In fact, he's, he's really known as God the Holy Spirit. Just as much as God the Father, God the Son, the third person is God the Holy Spirit. And the truth of the matter is, the Father God is seated in heaven on the throne. Jesus is physically seated in heaven at the right hand of the throne. The one who is with us every day down here on this place called earth is Holy Spirit. And God wants us to get to know him in an intimate way. We told you last week that now that you're born again, you're eligible for him to not only work with you like he did before salvation. Now that you're born again, he's living within you. Somebody shout, that's good news. I mean, the moment you say yes to Jesus Christ, you can't see it, you don't feel it, but Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of you, setting up camp in your heart. He, li he works with us, he lives within us, but then we learned last week there's another part of this, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where his power comes to rest upon us. We become immersed, we become submerged, we become f filled with his presence, and watch this, his presence when he comes upon us is not intended to make us do weird and spooky stuff. Come on, Holy Spirit, God is not weird and spooky. People can be weird and spooky. And sometimes people can represent him in a weird and spooky way. But God is not weird. God is not spooky. In fact, the, 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 the greatest result of what happens when Holy Spirit comes to set up camp in our lives is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. He says, now the Lord is that spirit. The word spirit, there's the Greek word pneuma again, means blast of breath or that strong breeze. And where the spirit of the Lord is... There is freedom. Somebody shout freedom. freedom. Come on, somebody shout freedom. freedom. Freedom is the ability to live as we should, not like we please. The ability to live like we should, not like we please or like we desire. Freedom is one of the greatest benefits that comes out of this marvelous relationship that we have with Holy Spirit. And I want to encourage you, too, that it's not too late. This upcoming Saturday, we have uh, something that we do twice a year called our Freedom Conference. And if you've never experienced one of our Freedom Conferences, it is a powerful something to, to behold. 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. It is a, a, an all-day opportunity to come and allow us to minister to you, share some things with you, and allow the presence and power of the Holy Spirit to help get you free from some stuff. We've seen people get free from sickness and disease. Come on, say amen for that. We've seen folks get free from depression and grief. People that have been tormented by grief and, and, and haunted by divorce. We've seen folks get filled with the Holy Spirit. It is free of charge. You can go to our website to sign up for it, and I guarantee you will not regret spending a day with God to let God do through you what the Holy Spirit wants to do, and that is set you free. Somebody shout amen. amen. In fact, say it, say it like this. God wants me to be free. Say it again. God wants me to be free. If you believe that, come on, give the Lord a shout of thanksgiving for that. God wants you free, free, free indeed. Now turn your Bibles to Psalm number 37. Psalm number 37. I want to wrap this teaching up today, next few minutes, and just share with you how not only does God want us to be free, 
He wants to lead us. He wants to guide us. He wants to direct us. In fact, in Psalm 37, verse number 23 says it this way. It says, the steps of a good man, and we know he's not talking about man in the sense of male, but the steps of a good man or woman are ordered by the Lord, and he, God, delights in his way. So in other words, in addition to Holy Spirit being our comforter and our counselor and our teacher and our advocate and being our standby, Holy Spirit is also intended by God, watch this, to be our navigation system. Amen. Not only does he want to be our teacher and our comforter, God also designed this wonderful gift of Holy Spirit who lives on the inside of us as believers to be our navigation system. In other words, he orders our steps. If you look up the word ordered there, it comes from a Hebrew word, which is kun, spelled K-U-W-N, kun. And it means to be firm, to be stable, to be established, and to be fixed. So the steps of a good man or woman are ordered by the Lord. The steps of a good man or woman are kewn. The steps of a good man or woman, watch this, are firm. The steps of a good man or woman are stable. They are established and they are fixed, which means when we are listening and flowing with the wisdom that Holy Spirit wants to bring to us on a daily basis, our steps won't be all over the map. We won't go, we won't go, you know, you know God intends for us to live our lives going from glory to glory. We don't have to go from glory to mess up to, to going backwards and then got to recover and then got to start all over again. God wants us to go from glory to glory, but that happens when we allow our steps to be ordered by our navigation system called Holy Spirit, which means he wants to work in us so that even when we make a misstep, he can take our misstep when we're really trying to surrender to him. He'll take our missteps, work it back into the plan, and still cause things to work out well for us. In fact, verse 24 says it this way, though he falls, he's talking about the man or woman that is good in God's sight, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord, watch this, upholds him with his hand. In other words, even when we make a misstep, the Bible says we won't be utterly cast down because God Almighty will grab us and keep us from experiencing the full measure of that mistake. Somebody ought to thank God for that. In a word, you know what that's called? That's called mercy. Anybody ever needed God's mercy? I'm going to ask again, anybody ever needed God's mercy? I'm going to give you one more chance. Anybody ever needed some of God's mercy? You better believe I have needed his mercy. I'm not talking about a long time ago before I got saved. I'm talking about every single day we need the mercy and the grace of God. But what God wants us to do is not have to live on this heavy dose of mercy. He wants us to come to this place where we live learning how to listen to Holy Spirit and allow him to direct our footsteps. Listen to this quote. Holy Spirit is on a full-time assignment to execute the Father's plan for our lives. If we were reading part of his job description, Holy Spirit is on a full-time, everyday assignment, and part of what he's looking to do is execute the Father God's plan for our lives. Remember in the beginning when it says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, the earth was without form and void, darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. That's, that's what he does over your life every day. He hovers over your life. And as God issues the word for what he wants to do and accomplish in your life, Holy Spirit goes to execute that plan. But the thing about God is that God is not a taskmaster. He's not a dictator. He won't take you and make you do the right thing. He won't make you do the, take the steps that lead toward prosperity. God is so loving that he protects our right to choose. God wants us to go to heaven. He wants us to be blessed. He wants us to be healed. But if we choose the opposite, he will let us have that. And so he's constantly working with us through the person of the Holy Spirit to get us moving in that direction so we can experience the full measure of what God intended for our lives. Turn to John chapter 16 with me. John chapter 16. I've been telling you this the last few weeks that as Jesus is on Thursday night before he's getting ready to be crucified on what we call Good Friday, he's having these last conversations with his disciples. He has what we call this Last Supper. And for, the, for three chapters in our Bible, chapter 14, chapter 15, and chapter 16, these are the last things that he says to them before he's arrested and taken away to be crucified. And the things he's talking about primarily in chapters 14, 15, and 16 is about Holy Spirit. And, and it makes sense. He's saying to them, I'm getting ready to leave you. I'm going to be crucified. Three days I'm going to be dead, then I'm going to be raised from the dead. But I'm going to come back. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And the disciples are weeping. They're, they're feeling horrible. He tells them, don't, be, don't let your heart be troubled. 
And he says, the reason why your heart shouldn't be troubled is because I'm going away, but I'm going to send you somebody to be just like I am in your life. And I, and I want to drive that point home. Holy Spirit is not some, you know, you know the third party, or if, if, you, if you want him, you can have him. If you don't want him, it's not that big deal. Holy Spirit is intended to be in our lives exactly what Jesus would be if he was here physically. Hmm? Now watch this, chapter 16, verse 12. Jesus says, I still have many things to say to you, but you're not ready to hear him now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, watch this, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak, watch this, and he will tell you things to come. Holy Spirit, he said, when he shows up, he's going to guide you into all truth. That's what we call navigate you. He's going to lead you around the potholes. He's going to tell you which way to go, tell you which job to take, Tell you, tell you which direction he wants you to go. Tell you who to marry. Tell you who to stay away from. He's going to lead you into all truth, but then he's going to do something else. He's going to show you things to come. I mean, the only one that can show you things to come is somebody that's already in the future. My sister turned me on a couple years ago to this uh, navigation system called Waze. And uh, I'm not getting paid anything. You think I'm a paid spokesman for Waze because I, I, I love this, this particular app. Uh, it's a navigation you know, app, and there's a lot of them out there, but this one in particular as a navigation system. You know, most navigation systems, you can punch in your destination from your house, and they'll give you some audible direction, tell you turn right up, the, up ahead, go a quarter of a mile, turn left at this place, you know, merge into the freeway. Waze does all of that, but Waze does something else beyond just navigation. Waze will also tell you things that are coming up along your route. So Waze will tell you that there's a, a car stranded just up ahead. Ways will tell you that there's an object on the road ahead. Ways will tell you there's a pothole coming up. And the one I really like is that Ways will tell you police reported ahead. <laughs> Can I just tell you Ways has saved my behind a many a day? <laughs> and the thing about Ways that makes it work is that it's, it's people helping people. So in other words, when you're driving down the road and you see something, you punch it in, and so the next guy behind you gets the benefit of the fact you've come this way already. So if you see something in the road, a pothole, or there's construction, or if a road is shut down, you can quickly add it to, 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 to your ways so that it now builds a database for the people coming behind you. How many know the Holy Spirit has already gone ahead of you? Come on, how many know there's some stuff that he knows that you don't know? Huh? But how many know, watch this, that the only way that the navigational system works is if you actually listen to it. Now, I don't know about your personality, but the way I'm wired is I, I'm one of those guys, I don't like reading the directions when I open a box. I get in trouble. I can't stand putting stuff together. When I have to put something together, I open a box, put all the stuff out there, and my little engineer mind says, all right, I can see how this goes. And I put this leg on there and screw that together and put this leg on there and screw that together, and I stand it up. It looks like it works. Only problem is I got 15 parts left. And the same thing happens sometimes even when I'm listening to my navigation system. I never get in trouble if I'm going somewhere where I have no idea where I'm going. If I'm in a city, I don't know where I'm going, I'm paying close attention. The navigation says turn left, I'm, I'm keyed in. I get in trouble with the navigation, watch this, when I think I know this area already. I'm teaching a good lesson right here. When I think I already know where I'm going... And I'm just kind of, I'm listening to the navigation, but just kind of out of, you know, obligation. I'm, I'm kind of listening, but I'm talking and I'm driving, and I'm not really keyed in. And in fact, this happened a, 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 a couple years ago when I first got this Waze uh, app on my phone. We are taking our staff down to Orlando for a little getaway, little retreat. And as we're heading down there, I mean, I've driven to Orlando so many times, I feel like I can drive down there with my eyes closed. You know, we have a church there that I pastored personally for the first two years. And was down there. I drove to Orlando every Saturday for Saturday morning service, every Wednesday for Wednesday night service for almost two years. So, I mean, I can drive to Orlando back and forth without even thinking about it. So, I'm driving to Orlando, and I'm heading down I-95 because I know. <laughs> to get to Orlando, you go I-95 until you get to I-4. You don't change until you get to I-4. Then you go I-4, and it takes you right into the city. So, I'm driving to Orlando, and I get down there just before Daytona, and the, the navigation system says... Exit at the upcoming exit to the right. And then my best friend, Sanford Voice, I say, you big dummy, you, you don't tell me to get off here. Because everybody knows you don't get off at this exit if you're trying to go to Orlando. 
So I, watch this, I did what we do sometimes with the Holy Spirit. I heard what the navigation said, but I ignored it. So I kept going. Got about a quarter of a mile past the exit that the ways told me to get off at, and traffic came to a screeching halt. I sat in traffic at a standstill, I mean, at a, at a snail's pace crawl for two hours. Two hours we were sitting there. There had been some domestic dispute between some man and his wife, and the police had shut the whole freeway down. And we sat in traffic for two hours. Cars were trying to go on the side and get around. Two hours of my life was wasted. <laughs> All because I felt like I knew better than the navigation. Another time I was coming back from Atlanta. Now I've been using Waze for a while. I know the route to get home from Atlanta. I'm driving from Atlanta. And Wade said, exit. Or, no, the Wade said, police are reported ahead. You know what I did? I slowed down. Checked my speedometer. And when I came up to the police, they, they, the guy was out there with his little radar like this. You know what I did? I just smiled and waved. <laughs> well, watch this. Holy Spirit knows some stuff about your future that you don't know. He said that he'll guide us into all truth, and he will watch us show us things to come. See, there are things that we have to understand. Holy Spirit will help you to know which house to buy, which job to take. He'll help you to know how to navigate around the potholes that show up in life, but it only works, watch this, when we listen to the navigation system. We can't assume, I know I got this, I can handle this, I don't need, I don't need any other direction. We got to be locked in, listening to Holy Spirit every single day to where we get up and we fine tune our, our hearing. That when Holy Spirit says, go to a different grocery store on your way home, we can't get locked in to the one that we normally go to. Come on, I'm preaching real good. I know the gas station you always stop at, but when the navigation says, don't stop there today, drive past that one, go two miles past your house to a different one. Well, guess what? You've never been to tomorrow. You've never been to three hours past today. Can I just say something? You've never been 30 seconds past right now. Which means all we know is what we are stuck in at the moment. So it behooves us to trust the one that's already gone ahead. They call him Alpha and Omega for a reason. They call him beginning and end for a reason. First and the last because every single part of our life, the past, the present, and the future is like one moment to God. And when we learn how to listen to Holy Spirit, he's constantly trying to take us around the potholes and try to walk us right into God's blessings for our lives. There are three areas in particular that I really believe he's working hard to try to lead us in. The first one is he wants to lead us in this area of passion. He wants to stir up our passion. John the Baptist said this in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. He says, I'm baptizing you here in the river. Turn your old life in for a kingdom life. He said, but the real action comes next. The main character in this drama. Compared to him, I'm a mere stagehand. He's going to ignite, watch this, the kingdom life within you. He's going to ignite a fire within you. The Holy Spirit within you, changing you from the inside out. Do you hear what Jesus said? I mean, John the Baptist said, he said, when Jesus shows up, he's coming to ignite a kingdom life in you. He's coming to ignite a fire or a passion within us. In other words, from God's perspective, God never intended for us to do anything halfway. And there's one thing that I as a personally just can't stand is when believers who say that we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we're on God's side, but we don't do stuff with any level of passion. I don't know if you've noticed, but we look around today, we, we see a passionless generation. Very little emotion, very little initiative. And that's now what God has called us to be. God has called us to be people that have passion, man. If you're going to believe something, believe it all the way. God never called us to come over to Christianity and, and dip our toes in it and test and see how good the water is. God called us to be passionate, which means if you're going to be saved, be for real saved. Can I just say this? If you're going, if you're going to be a sinner, be a real sinner. Don't come to church every week messing you know, wasting on a good time on a Sunday. If you're going to go to hell, don't, I mean, don't, don't, don't spend all this time coming to church and singing songs and then die and go, how did I end up in hell? <laughs> if you're going to go to hell, go to hell big time, man. Sin for real. Let them have your name on the marquee. Introducer. <laughs> but if you're going to go to heaven, come on, somebody. Let's not do it halfway. 
Let's be passionate about this thing. And part of what the Holy Spirit does is come to stir up our passion. So many believers bounce in and out of depression and in and out of discouragement because they live their life with just a little flickering flame. The reason why so many believers, you know, are on fire for God one day, then I don't know if I love God. I'm questioning the Bible tomorrow. <laughs> you know why? See, you have passion, man. You get stirred up with passion. You can't just come and, you know, tell me a couple of scriptures you learned in some little Bible study and think you're going to take me off of what I believe. See, Jesus, Jesus warned about this in, in the book of Revelation. He's writing to, to John, the apostle. And he was talking about a church, the church at Laodicea. And what he said about them, he said, look, I, I, I'm having some trouble with you because you're not hot and you're not cold. You're lukewarm. In fact, he said, I, I, I feel like vomiting you out of my mouth because I'd rather you be either red hot or be, be completely cold. And if you, if you understand the region of, of where he's talking about, that, that city was located on the Lycus River. That's what it calls Laodicea. And five miles south of the city of Laodicea, there was a, a red hot mineral spring water uh, aqueduct and there was an aqueduct that flowed from those hot mineral springs and it flowed up to Laodicea and flat it, it flow, flowed past Laodicea it was red hot when it left the, the the hot water springs but by the time it traveled five miles to get to Laodicea watch this it was no longer hot because it had traveled five miles but guess what it also wasn't cold because it hadn't gone far enough to be cold water so it wasn't hot enough water to bathe in. It wasn't cold enough water to have for drinking water. It was just lukewarm. And he was saying to the church at Laodicea, you become just like this lukewarm water. Can I tell you there are a lot of believers that have just become lukewarm? Come to church every now and then. Come to church when it's convenient. Wake up on a Sunday morning. I don't feel like going there. When, when did feelings have anything to do with this? We don't wake up in the morning and ask God, does he feel like turning the oxygen on for us? How I many know, get thank, thankful that God doesn't wake up and say, well, I, I don't feel like putting angels on, on dispatch for you today. No, God takes care of us every day. Every part of our life ought to be red hot on fire for Jesus. Come on, help me out, somebody. And, and what I've come to realize, a lot of believers start off in their Christian walk, and they're red hot at first. But then what happens is problems show up. And people go through a difficult time, maybe lose a loved one, which is tragic and horrific. Maybe go through a, a divorce or something else, and the problems end up dampening their flame. Some people end up having persecution. You have friends and family that talk about them, mistreat them, and the persecution makes them back away, and they stop being on fire for God. But then there's another one I found. Some people allow prosperity to, to put their flame out. Some people are red hot as long as they need rent money. Red hot as long as they needed God to perform a miracle in their body. But sometimes what happens is when we get the miracle, I'm preaching real good right now. Sometimes when we get the man we've been standing and believing for, sometimes when we get the job we've been praying for, and I've seen this one so many times, sometimes when we finally get the baby we've been believing for. If you don't watch, you can end up worshiping that little baby, having the baby keep you away from God because now the prosperity has taken away your fire. I'm preaching so good. Holy Spirit comes to breathe on our flame to make sure we stay passionate and red hot for Jesus. Time to get on fire and stay on fire. Don't count on anybody else to make you happy, and don't leave it to anybody else to get you excited for Christ. Nobody should ever have to stir you up to praise God. In fact, come on, you ought to just praise God right now because he's been good to you. Come on, you ought to just praise God right now. Come on, you ought to take about 30 seconds just praise God right now. Come on, you ought to praise God with some red hot passionate praise right now when you think about God's goodness and everything he's done for you praise God for how good he's been man second area that Holy Spirit is trying to lead us in he wants to lead us in purity purity Hebrews chapter 10 verse 14 says for by one sacrifice God has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. One sacrifice is all it took for God to make perfect, to perfect forever. Those of us who are in this process, this journey of being made holy. In other words, God is the one who credits us. He makes us righteous. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that the one who knew no sin was made to be sin for us so we could be made the righteousness of God. 
There's nothing we can do to work ourselves to be considered right in God's sight. He makes us righteous. But can I tell you, he gives us credit for being righteous. But then every day we get up, Holy Spirit is taking us through a process called sanctification. Which means, yes, God sees us like we should be. He treats us based on how we should be. But that doesn't stop him from every single day working with us to help us grow into the image of what he's already given us credit for. Which means even with this amazing grace that we walk in, every day you get up, there's always something God's working on you with. And see, God, God, God is a master surgeon. He'll, he'll work with you and he'll surgically remove stuff from you. Sometimes he'll surgically remove some people out of your life. Sometimes he'll surgically add some stuff to you, augment your life in some ways where you can be stronger and healthier. And what we've got to understand is that God loves us right where we are. If you never change one bit, God's not going to love you any more or any less. But can I just tell you something that sometimes people don't want to talk about? There are some blessings in your life that will not show up until you mature enough to be ready to handle them. Thank God for grace. I'm a, I'm a big teacher of grace. I believe in the grace of God. You can live just like you live right now. You don't have to get any better. God's going to still love you right where you are. But there are some manifestations that will not show up. No matter how much you pray, no matter how much money you throw on the altar, no matter how much you confess, there's certain manifestations that will not show up until we become mature enough to be ready to handle them. Give you a good example to help you to see it. I have a 10-year-old son. He's our youngest. He loves cars, has always loved cars since he was a little boy. Right now, he, he's already telling us what car he wants when he turns 16. I mean, I, I don't mean what car in general. He knows the exact model, the type of engine he wants in it. And I'm trying to tell him, well, that car might not even exist by the time you turn 16. Huh? And how I many know I love him enough to give him that car today? But I love him enough not to give him that car today. I've got the ability to go and buy that car for him today. And I, my love for him is strong enough. That I, I, I would love to give him that car today, but I love him so much, I wouldn't dare give him that car today. You know why? Because today, even though he's got a love for the car, even though he would call me the greatest daddy on planet Earth if I showed up with the car, if I gave him the car today, it would end up hurting him and maybe hurting somebody else. There's some things we pray for at times that God wants you to have it, but he can't give it to you until we mature enough. Let him work some fruit of the Spirit in us. Come on, talk to me, somebody. We stop being so up and down and, you know, full of joy one day, and I'm depressed the next day. I'm, I'm running with God. Where the devil at? I'm going to kick his butt now. Oh, I quit. I'm done. God wants us to get to the place where we become steady. Come on, somebody. He wants us to get to the place to where our greatest love is not the cars and the houses and the jobs. See, there's some people, if God gave you that dream job today, you'd move away from family. You'd move away from the Word. You do whatever it takes to get in position for that job or that career, for that big break in, the, in acting or that big break for your business. And God wants you to get to the place where if he gave that thing to you, you won't love it more than you love him. So Holy Spirit is constantly working with us to work his purity into our lives. Third thing he's trying to do in us. Holy Spirit wants to work his peace in us. His peace. Colossians 3.15 says it this way from the Amplified Bible. It says, let the peace, the soul harmony that comes from Christ, let it rule or act as umpire continually in your hearts, deciding and settling with finality all the questions that arise in your minds. God wants to work his peace into your life. See, this, one of the things that, that Holy Spirit uses to direct us and guide us is this thing called peace. See, there are certain things you can go to, the, you can turn to the Bible. If you want to know, is it God's will to be healed? Because I grew up in churches, man, where, where, where they would pray like this, Lord, if it's your will, heal brother so-and-so. Can I just tell you, it's always God's will for you to be healed. You say, yeah, but I, I, you know, I, I, got, I got a disease that came upon me because I was doing the wrong thing. God's mercy endures forever. Even if you did something that brought this on you, he still loves you enough. It is his will for you to be healed. You don't have to ever ask, is it your will, God? It's his will. It's God's will for your needs to be met. God doesn't want you in poverty and in hungry and needs aren't being met. But there are certain things you can't turn to a scripture to find out. You can't turn to the scripture to find out, should I buy this house over here on Remnar Street or this house over here on 3rd Boulevard? You can't turn to a certain scripture that says, should I take this job over here in Jacksonville? Or should I take the one in St. Louis that's paying me $30,000 more? There's no scripture you can turn to. The way in which we find that out is that we got to spend enough time with God in prayer. 
And one of the best things to do is what I taught you last week. Get filled with the Holy Spirit, with the Bible evidence, to speak with other tongues. Learn how to pray in the Spirit. And the more you pray in the Spirit, talking to God spirit to spirit, guess what happens? It calms your emotions down. In fact, it doesn't calm your emotions down. It turns the volume down. Emotions are always there. Our intellect is always telling us what makes the most sense. But the more we spend time praying and spend time communing with Holy Spirit, the volume gets turned down on our emotions. The volume gets turned down on our intellect. The volume gets turned down on everybody else's opinion. Before you know it, you start to see real clearly, I have peace to do this. And what's amazing is sometimes the thing you have peace to do is not even the thing you want to do. The Bible says when you get peace, let peace be the umpire. I mean, when the umpire says you're out, you're out. The umpire says you're safe, you're safe. There's no more arguing once peace comes in to be the umpire. If there's one thing I would, would plead with you to walk out of here with for this series, walk out of here with understanding. we got to live our lives, learn to live our lives in the peace of God. See, the peace of God will tell you which job to take. The peace of God will tell you which home to take. Can I just say, the peace of God will tell you when to let that man go because he's not the right one for you. Emotions are saying, no, 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 I've been waiting for so long, finally. But the peace of God will say, no. It looks right, seems right, but the peace of God said, but it ain't right. Amen. Minister Henderson reminded me of a story that she, she gave me permission to share. Wasn't that long ago, one of her exes showed up in her life. And she'd been standing for, to be married for some years, man, serving God with all of her heart. And an ex shows up. And she starts to communicating with them and things are going progressing okay but on the inside she just got this something's not right here and without having any external reason to call it off she said you know what I, I just don't I don't sense this broke it off fast forward about four years later she gets a call from some family back in Detroit and the same ex that she refused to proceed with because of a check in, in here it's all over the news that he had found somebody to date, got married to that person, and it ended up committing murder, killed that person, and I think committed suicide. You know, that could have been her. You know, everybody would have been saying, why did God let this happen? Why would God let this happen? That some pre preacher would stand up and say, the Lord gives, the Lord take away. The Lord had nothing to do with that. The Lord is the one leading us around those dangers. But it's incumbent upon us Spend enough time with Holy Spirit. Let him be your best friend. Get up every day and say, Holy Spirit, just guide me today. He doesn't expect you to be real deep and, and, and extra spiritual. Just ask him, Lord, Holy Spirit, guide me today. I'm open and available. I'm willing to change whatever you want me to change. He'll begin guiding you step by step. He'll teach you how to have a better marriage. Come on, somebody. He'll teach you how to raise your children right. He'll tell you when there's something, there's something they're, they're telling you, yeah, yeah, everything's fine, but on, on the inside, you know something's not quite right. Holy Spirit is that guide, that teacher. He'll lead us when we take the time to listen to him. Come on, lift up your hands. Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you, Lord. Come on, we thank you, Lord. Come on, we thank you, Lord. We are grateful, Holy Spirit, for your leading. Thank you for guiding us. Thank you for directing us. Uh, we're spirit-led men and women. We're spirit-led teenagers. You don't have to wait till you're an adult. Holy Spirit will lead you as a teenager. He'll lead you as a small child. All he asks you to do is surrender to him. Open up your heart. Begin listening to him. Ask him to speak to me. Direct me. Guide me. He'll begin prompting you from the inside out, showing you what to do, what not to do. I guarantee you, you'll walk into a far better life than the one you could create on your own. Thank you, Lord. Now look up here at me for just a moment. I wrote this note to make sure I don't forget it. So many results that we blame on the devil are really a result of overriding the Holy Spirit's navigation and ending up on a dead end road. And for many of you in here, that's you today. You look around, your life has just hit a dead end stall, man. And for some of you, you came in here hopeless today. You came in here feeling like, man, I mean, some of you, as I've been preaching, you've been, you've been saying to yourself, I wish somebody had told me this years ago before I made so many mistakes. Can I just encourage you today? The encouragement I want to give you is that the thing about God, he's the greatest navigation system ever. The thing I love about the navigation system, as long as you don't turn it off, no matter how many wrong turns you take, it'll keep on saying, recalculating your out. And for some of you, all you need today, you don't need to give up. Don't you dare throw in the towel. 
Life would not be better without you. All you got to do, surrender one time and let God recalculate your out. You look up one year from now, your life will be so glorious, you have a hard time recognizing your new life. Because that's what happens when we surrender to the presence of the Holy Spirit. Every head bowed, please. All eyes closed in prayer. No one moving except those we've assigned to do so. All heads bowed, all eyes closed. I want to ask you right now, ma'am or sir, teenager, if you're here and you can honestly say, Pastor, if I were to walk out of here right now and breathe my last breath, I don't know that I would go to heaven. In fact, some of you may say, I know I wouldn't go to heaven. And you think it's because of all the things you've done wrong, all the mistakes you've made, maybe the sin you think you're committing even right now. Can I tell you that there's no sin that sent a person to hell? The one sin that sends a person to hell is the sin of rejecting Jesus Christ as Lord. Because God sent his son, allowed his blood to pay the price for every sin we could ever commit. And when we yield our hearts and our lives to him, God applies his blood to our sin account, wipes it out for us, gives us a brand new fresh start. And then he'll take us by the hand and teach us how to live this new life that he's called us to. So if you're here today, ma'am or sir, young person, and you honestly can say in your heart that I don't know Jesus Christ as my Lord, but I'm ready, ready to give him control of my life, ready to yield my life to him, to surrender to him today, would you please give me this highest honor to pray with you today? I'm not going to embarrass you. Nobody's going to ask you to stand up and come here to the front. Right there in your seat where you are, I'm just going to ask you to repeat a basic prayer with me. And if you mean that with all your heart, God will change your life right there where you're sitting. Most, most, the most private thing you've ever done, but the most powerful thing you've ever done is right there at your seat. So if you say, yes, Pastor, you just described me, and I'm ready to yield my life to Jesus today, then let me know right there, right now, that I'm praying for you. But just lifting up your hand right there where you are. Come on. Everybody's head is bowed. Thank you. I see that hand there. Come on. All eyes are closed. Lift up your hand. Thank you. Another hand right there. Come on. Who else today? Say, yes, Pastor. You just described me. Thank you. See that hand right there. Thank you. Another hand right there. Thank you. Another hand right there. Thank you. See that hand there. Come on. Who else? I know in my heart there's at least another 10, 15, maybe even 20 people that God is tugging on your heart. For whatever reason, you're having a hard time slipping your hand up. I promise you we're not going to embarrass you. You can slip your hand up. Just give me a chance to acknowledge it then put it right back down. That's all I'm asking you to do. The only reason I want you to raise it is so that you and God know, I hear you talking to me, Lord, and I'm saying yes to you. Come on, who else? Thank you. See that hand there? Another hand right there. Another hand there in the back. Come on, who else? Who else? Who else? Anybody in the overflow room? Anybody online? Anybody there at, at Lottie? Huh? Any, anybody there at Montgomery? We say yes. Anybody there at Law? We say yes. I, I, I sense God is talking to me. Go ahead right there where you are. Lift up your hands. Our team will acknowledge you right there where you are. Thank you. Another hand right there. Beautiful, beautiful. How about this? Anybody willing to say something on the inside is telling me that I need to get in on this prayer? That's the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Go ahead and say yes to him and just shoot your hand up. See that hand there? Thank you. Another hand there in the back. Thank you, ushers. Another hand there to the side. Beautiful. All right, I want to ask every one of you that raised your hand for prayer to pray this prayer just loud enough for you and God to hear it. The rest of the believers in here will be softly praying right there at their seat. Pray this out loud. Say, dear God in heaven, thank you for loving me today. Thank you for bringing me here to receive this word. I know you've been leading me. You led me here today. I receive this word today. I know in my heart that Jesus died for my sins, but I also know you raised him from the dead. I'm asking you right now, Jesus, come into my heart. Save me now. Forgive me for trying to live this life without you. I surrender my whole life to you. And for the rest of my days, I'm completely yours. And according to the Bible, I am right now born again. Amen. Come on, put your hands together. Help me celebrate with these men and women. Come on, you can do better than that. Lives just got changed right there around you. I want to say congratulations to every one of you that prayed that prayer along with me. God really did just step in to change your life right there where you're sitting. Now the next step is to now grow in your relationship with God. We would love to help you with that part of it. So there's a card we mentioned it earlier. It's called a connection card. It should be one in the seat pocket right there in front of you. Would you please take that card and fill it out before you leave today? We're not going to call you to stop by your house. I want to personally send you a letter to give you some next steps so that you'll know what to do now that you've made this wonderful decision for Jesus. Check the box that says, I committed my life to Christ today. 
And when you finish with that card, you can give it to the ushers in the blue shirts, and they'll get it to me, or just put it into the offering bucket if you finished it by that time when it comes by. We're so excited for you, and we know God has great things in store for your life. Come on, put your hands together again. Help me celebrate with these men and women. Praise God. Now it's our opportunity to take what God has given to us to worship him with our giving. So if you need an offering envelope for your giving, you can look into the seat pocket right there in front of you. There should be one there. Or lift up your hand and our ushers will be glad to give you an offering envelope. You might need one of the green and blue I give online cards. We have a lot of people. About 70% of our giving comes in online. And I would certainly encourage you even to automate your giving if that's what you're inclined to do. That way you don't even have to you know, run the risk of missing out on the chance to worship God with your giving. But even if you do it that way, we still encourage you to take one of these green and blue I give online cards. Because there's something happening. There's something happening in the spirit right now. Yesterday, if you missed Saturday morning prayer yesterday, man, you missed good stuff. We had a wonderful time in here in prayer. Right at the end, the Lord said something to us. He said, we're in, we're in the midst of a all things are possible kind of season. One of the things that he says that it's important in a season like this, don't just walk around your, 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 your Jericho wall. Go ahead and let out that cry of praise unto God. And I promise you, as you do, you're getting ready to see God move in your life in some ways that you have never seen him move before. I mean, we're in such a miracle season. I'm expecting at any moment, man, somebody's getting ready to walk up to me, walk up to you, and just wow you in a way that's just going to blow your mind because you're putting your trust in God. Anybody believe that other than me? Anybody ever want to pray? Do you ever believe that? God's got a wild moment that he's ready to unleash in your life. Come on, lift up your offering. Thank you, Father, for the privilege we have to worship you now. We give back unto you a portion of what you've given to us, and we thank you. We worship you with it today. Angels of God, go forth. Bring back to us the return on our seed song. We receive it, and we thank you for today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Us, as you may receive the offering, once that bucket passes your rope, go ahead and stand up to your feet and join our worship team as they lead us out in worship.